<laughs> Rabbits don't come from eggs. Technically, they do. We all do. We just don't all come from reptiliano, eggs. Luis? ¿Eres reptiliano, Luis? <laughs> hey, hey, hey. <laughs> Reptiliano. Not all eggs have hard shells, man. <laughs> all right. I think our live stream is active. <clears throat> it's taking a moment here, but we at least have the recording going. So we'll go ahead and get this show on the road. Bienvenidos a todos. Uh, it's good to have all of you here. Um, today we are joined by a special guest, a friend that we made uh, last year. Whoops. Hey, what's going on with our live streams? Nothing's working. Are you guys able to hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. I don't know what's going on with our live streams. Um, for some reason, it said it wasn't working, and now it is. So, <laughs> set by the All right. So, again, getting us back on the road. Um, so, today we're joined by a special guest, a friend that we made last year uh, at the Print Pomona Art Book Fair. I think I said that right. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I, go I call him my tocayo. We have Bl Luis Blacayer. Um, who is a photographer, visual artist, uh, an amazing person, um, hailing originally from Mexico City and joining us from L.A. And I really don't know a whole lot to say other than um, his work is awesome. He, on uh, social media, uses at cartoon distortion, cartoon underscore distortion. Um, so you can obviously follow him on any of the socials that you might be using um but i don't really want to take too much away from from him talking about his own work um because i definitely am a fan and i'm really happy to have you here tokayo uh also for anybody that is curious we did have a longer interview with him uh for the art block podcast a few months back so you can always check that out on spotify apple podcasts and also on our youtube channel um <laughs> Abraham, we're not going to cause a distortion in the uh, fabric of space time, so I think we're okay. <laughs> uh, we're not the same person. <laughs> but that said, uh, you know, we obviously are uh, very privileged to have Luis in the house tonight. So, oh, thank you, um, thank you Tokayo. Thank you for joining us. Este, you know, ojalá y nos enseñes algo interesante. And with that, uh, I guess I'll pass it off to you. I'll I'll do my best and uh, thank you Tokayo for inviting me to be here. Um, I was a little confused at the beginning because we're both called Luis and I think they were talking to you. Somebody was talking to you and I thought they were talking to me, which is pretty <laughs> fun. Uh, but no, it feels now like forever that I have known uh, Luis and Abraham, even though it's only been uh, one year. We've uh, had uh, some fun together, and uh, uh, it seems uh, that uh, we have a shared passion for photography and how it relates with the written word in like a diversity of forms. Uh, so you know, I I, I prepared one of those um, slideshow decks to go over some of my work. I'll kick it off in just about a minute. But uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about what that is going to be about and how I came to put it together just over the weekend, uh, even though I'm going to talk about a bunch of work that in some cases is decades old. Uh, I just uh, put together this uh framing of this presentation this weekend based on uh conversation uh i had with luis uh just a week ago more or less in which he explained me about this 
uh, workshop that you all are having together and how it's been framed around this uh, concept of, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, expresses, and uh, which is something that uh, as a word uh, turned out to be new to me, uh, even though it refers to ideas that, as you will kind of see, are very familiar to me, and it is somewhat related with uh, methods that I usually uh, incorporate to my practice. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to go to a few pro through a few projects that have to do with uh, how I use photography to think about telling stories and how that is related very closely to uh, an experience of the city in general at the ground level, which is something that uh, I like a lot to experience the city as a pedestrian and try to derive meaning from it, not, not just to express things I want to tell, but to try and understand our relationship with uh, life in the city and uh, technology and media and uh, things like that. Um, I have a background in filmmaking, specifically production design, which has to do with putting together the world around the camera and the director and the performers of a film so that they can perform the story by inhabiting it. And a lot of that has to do with going to places in the world and adjusting them or uh, appropriating elements from them to create these worlds in which these uh, films will take place. Uh, just uh, naturally, without even thinking about it, this this definitely started um, permeating into the way I look at things and the way I try to conceive stories and relationships. Um, so with that, I think that that's probably a good intro to where I'm going to get into. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say before I get started is that I'm going to go through a uh, few projects. Uh, I have like five or six of them uh, prepared to go through. And, you know, it's it's going to take some time to go through all of them. Maybe, maybe it's worth uh, taking a breath between each one of them and you know having a little bit of a conversation about them like ask questions and things like that if if you all think that's a uh appropriate uh, appropriate way of going about things and then again you know happy to be interrupted in the middle of anything uh, no problem so that said uh i think i'm gonna fire up that thing um, which will require that I mm, do the share screen thing. Uh, here it is. Let's see. Uh, Does that look okay? Yeah, looks good. Cool. Yes. All right. Does do, do we want to kind of like, does anyone want to say something before we get started? Sigle, tocayo. Le seguimos. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, my name, uh, my website, my... Instagram account, which even though I 
dislike anything that has to do with the company called Meta. I have found that a lot of the people that I love in the community that I want to be a part of are there. So I just, uh, you know, I'm happily active on Instagram. Uh, so here's some of the, oh my God, let me see. Okay, where's my thing? Sorry, I'm having some cursor difficulties. I don't know where my cursor is. I cannot see it. There it is. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Um, yeah, I cannot see my cursor, so I might jump in and out of the presentation whenever I need to do something on the screen. Uh, but this is something that I, I was talking about before, you know, thinking about photography and writing and uh, what it means to me. It has to do with building narrative meaning from experience. Uh, photography is a good way as well as like film video and other recording methods to capture uh, information from reality that can uh, be afterwards used to produce other materials. Uh, and even though exercise is not, you know, precisely defined this way, uh, it seems to be a literary, literary device, literary device to write uh, about or inspired by. Uh, other forms of art, like the visual arts, architecture, things like that. Uh, I think it lives in this uh, more uh, malleable realm of like uh, spaces where a lot of uh, things intersect. And I think, or at least I believe that I have been using some form of ekphrasis uh, in my practice for a long time as a bridge to create fiction by uh, capturing uh, aspects of experience and then playing with them to storyboard, to make designs, to explore concepts, even to interpret them. Um, and uh, that happens very clearly in film. I could, you know, think about a scene uh, that happens in downtown LA and try and figure out how to uh, stage it by taking a bunch of pictures of it and drawing on top of them. And then I have a storyboard. Uh, it's actually a very powerful tool to uh, uh, make illustrations you come up with a concept for illustration, then you research the stuff that's gonna be in that illustration, and then you can use those materials to create your illustration. But um, from the perspective of uh, narrative and uh, coming up with actual stories to tell within the background of a particular city, I have found myself oftentimes uh, going through the city, creating images by taking photographs, by filming, but then drawing on top of them, then rearranging them in ways that let me somehow conceptualize and envision or imagine a sort of series of situations that Take place, take place within them, within them that could let me also think about uh, what life is like in this city and also think about stuff that I could find meaningful to tell about the inhabitants of this city, about the city that they inhabit, if you will. That sounds like a little bit like a tongue twister, but um you you will probably find that a little bit more clear when i go through the examples in a way uh photography as a medium 
has changed a lot from the time I was born to today. Um, and I'm going to start going to the projects now. And the first one is called Ojo de Gato. It's a project from the 20th century that I put together uh, between 1997 and 1998. And it's a perfect example of what I was just saying before about how much photography has changed. And, you know, I was pretty much born with the camera in my pocket, believe it or not. Uh, but I didn't get my hands on, to, on a digital camera until like probably 1999 or the year 2000, believe it or not as well. Um, so this project, even though I was already using photography in a way that feels uh, very digital, very invasive, very kind of in the middle of my experience of everyday life, it was still done with uh, uh, with uh, film photography using this uh, small camera called the uh, Canon Elf, I think, which used uh, this little film cartridges called APX. And it was very practical because you could actually do the thing where you had it in your pocket. At that time, uh, I don't know everywhere else, but at least in Mexico City, um, people already had cell phones in their pockets and they also had these uh, pagers for text messaging. And I did uh, adopt the pagers, but I refused to have a cell phone until a lot later. Uh, so in my pockets, you could find a pager, a wallet, and this little tiny camera. The photograph that you see here was taken with that camera and it's a photograph of an installation I made uh, which is called Ojo de Gato which I assembled uh, using my archive or my collection of photography taken during and around jobs that I was doing in Mexico City as a uh, art director and as a set designer for film and television, going to warehouses, going to city dumps to find things that I could use, going to sound stages, going to buildings where locations were gonna be. And I went back to these photographs and I, oh, come on, how does this go? Oh, there, I went back to this photograph and I started assembled, assembling them in a way that I felt I could find the means to tell a story that would be uh, a night in the life of a stray cat, a street cat in Mexico City, which there's a ton of those and you see them around and you can always uh, imagine the stuff they'd see, right? Because they can sneak around anywhere and they can see everything. Um, so, you know, all these photographs, a lot of them, like I said, are more like around the work. Some of them are pictures of objects, pictures of printed materials, pictures of people, pictures of cats, which, you know, there's cats everywhere. And I would just take pictures all the time, like I do today with my phone, but under those circumstances, um, I think, uh, there's this, uh, transformation that happens here, as I showed in that first slide with that diagram, in which a personal experience of the city is now transformed through this mediation, through photography and through drawing, screen printing, into these building blocks for something that could be, you know, very roughly, uh, very brush strokes, uh, conceived as uh, some sort of uh, telling of a story and a silent movie comic book form. And uh, every time I install it, I can rearrange the uh, frames and I can also uh, take some of them out. Uh, there's a very long story that happens on the little squares and then the larger squares are kind of the 
trailer for that story if you want to think about it that way um uh, but it always ends with the cat run over by uh by uh by a car uh, so it's a cat witnessing humans and it's a kind of like a very dreamlike kind of story so this is i think the first time in my life where i deliberately even though not fully conscious of what i was doing uh tried to use uh my addiction to photography i think my uh compulsion to photograph stuff all the time as a sort of raw material to assemble something that could be put together as a different form uh, which is a written form that is taking place as sequential art in this case through the uh, installation um, to tell some kind of experience of a story and uh, uh, this you know took me different places later on I think this piece is very straightforward in that regard you know you have a bunch of photographs and then you transform them into something that then you can use to have a very uh, loose kind of story but it took me to a way a very different kind of places um, ultimately bringing me back to uh, material that um, it could potentially be conceived as more traditional, but where I find that uh, there's a more clear vision of how I am using the imagery to understand how to, in my case, tell stories. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the end of that one. Do we want to talk about it a little bit? Ask questions or uh Yes. There you go. So can I can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm just wondering, um you have a, quite a few abstract slides. And I'm wondering what you know, is it the sky or is it representative of something? And also my other question is. Um, you took, it looks like they're, you took them and the photographs and you, you, you morphed them with some kind of pro program. And I'm wondering if that, you did that. Ah, uh, well, those are great questions. Uh, this project in particular, uh, has a lot to do with, uh, the experience of a printmaking technique called uh, screen printing. Um, back then, uh, I had the I was commissioned to produce um, a few fake Andy Warhol artworks for a Mexican movie called uh, Sex of Pudor y Lágrimas. And I had, I was given a lot, some freedom. They wanted to have something like, there's a Warhol piece that is made of the face of Mao Zedong uh, nine times. And Warhol would do this thing where he would have the screens and he would just kind of like, just the squeegee to gloss over them and create these very uh, expressionistic forms of different colors that would make the pictures of the same screen kind of like unique and different. And then by arranging them together, he would get this very decorative piece that would show kind of the variations that would come from the screen printing form if you treat it like as a painter, right? Uh, I did one uh, in this movie that used uh, Ho Chi Minh instead of Mao Zedong. But just for fun, just to kind of like have my fun with it, I experimented on it with uh, printing on stainless steel. And what you get with printing on stainless steel is that the 
ink, which is like slightly transparent, lets you see through and still reflects the light and those kinds of things. And it also becomes very apparent the patterns that the squeegee does. So these uh, uh, squares that you pointed out that are very abstract um, are meant to represent blank spots in the consciousness of this cat. They could be that the cat is dreaming or just passed out or we don't know. They are like little moments of like disruption that when you go through this and start to realize there might be a story there, which is something that is not told to you as somebody that experiences this installation, you, it's an opportunity for you to think about how these things were made and also take a little breath, right? So that's what they are for. They are like moments of emptiness from the perception of the character that is carrying on the perspective of the story. Um, the way the images were put together uh, is very interesting. This was, you know, computers were already there. Photoshop was already there, um, but it was, you know, a lot more resource intensive to do anything with that. Uh, I could go on Photoshop and manipulate my photographs. And then in order for me to make the positives to print this, I would have to spend a ton of money that I didn't have at the time, right? And and what they ended up doing, because the photographs were actually taken with a camera that is not digital, with that Canon ELF camera, and that's where these, these little squares come in. These little squares are really like four by four inches or something like that. And I would take the prints that came out of, you know, where you went and print your photos, like the Kodak booth at the CBS or whatever it is. And I would trace on top of them with uh, transfer paper to get the figure of the design. And the figure of the design was the black ink. Uh, then, I did all those and I went to a photo photocopy place and blew them up to three times their size, which is the next type of the squares. And I have them just like photocopies of like black and white drawings. And then I used those, but I traced directly onto the screen print screen uh, with the, the blocking chemical that stops the ink from going through. So I was tracing those drawings on the negative form. And I did the same with the red. So it's really like two colors because the first thing you do is the blue, but you're playing around. There's no image. And then you print the red and then you print the, the, the black. But that's how it came to be the, the uh, editing of the photography to turn it into these more, more graphical forms was done uh, as an analog project, pro process for the most part, really. Uh, there was no digital involved in this case, uh, which I find uh, today very refreshing. Back then, I did it because it was cheaper. <laughs> but uh, now I would do it because I don't want to use a computer in purpose sometimes. Um, I, I I don't know if that more or less. No, it was beautiful. That's beautiful. I, I really, I just wrote it, you know, I, I think that you're transferring a lot more emotion into the pieces versus it being a digital image. It's really interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, it makes them a lot more expressive and it kind of like really embraces the error. Uh, another thing you can see is, you know, when you do a uh, super precise type of screen print, uh, it's very difficult to get them right because there's tiny lines and a lot of colors and you have to be very careful with what how you do it. Here, it was like very easy to just do it. And, and you know, if things didn't match exactly, they would create artifacts that actually were embraced by the style. So it was very easy to produce. And because of the scale of it, 
Uh, I really needed that. Uh, this was part of a workshop and I had to get this ready in like a month or so. so and I had one person helping me. So uh, it was kind of like some of the release to the more expressionistic style of it was uh, not just for creative or poetic reasons, but also practical ones, which are always important. Um, so there's that one. It's kind of, I wanted to use it as a intro to where we're heading. And uh, we do have a couple more questions, Tokayo. Uh, there you go. Fire, fire them up. So the, this one comes from Eric. It says, thank you for sharing Ojo de Gato. I really like the use of three focused colors to tell the story. Those mini images to the right of the storyboard, the sequential art, how did they add to the narrative? Y luego Abraham, this place. Uh, they, they imagine that the bigger the the it's like the bigger frames tell you the story like a trailer like in 10 minutes if you will and when you go at the little ones you start to recognize that some of the big ones are there but there's a lot more to that that expands on the duration on the uh sequence of, of actions that take place around like every situation so it's 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 basically the same narrative and it's the same idea in the sense that it is not very clear what's going on you know it's a cat wandering around the city at night it always ends the same way but it carries you through a series of events in which you see uh, things happening but that's that's what those are and part of the it being as loose as it is uh, allows me to reconfigure them every time. So like I can come in and re-edit just by putting them up in a well and choosing the sequence to go in a different order. Oh, Abraham? My question is, how do you end up choosing those three colors if you think about it? And also, how many screens do you have to print for this? <laughs> a burn. <laughs> Well, the colors, how do you choose the colors uh, comes with just, uh, that's just a insight, right? Uh, I was working on the Ho Chi Minh piece before I used a lot of colors and I kind of got enamored with that combination and I went with it because it has good contrast and it looks good. Uh, the screens were not printed, like I painted on them by hand with this blocking material. And these are like, each one of the prints are only one of a kind, right? So I didn't print 10 of them of each, right? It's just one. So what I would do is I would go to my friend's shop that I was working with and we would have, uh, I don't know how many screens we had. They were the bigger square size. And I would print a few of them, not, not print, I would, I would go with my, you know, my drawings and my photocopies. I would paint on them with this blue liquid, which is called bloqueador, which means blocker. Uh, I still, I still use it. That thing is very useful for that because you just get the screen and you paint on it, and where you paint, it's like negative. The the, the ink is not gonna go through that. You paint on it, you let it dry, you print, and then you wash it, you paint on it, you print. Uh, <laughs> so like. We would do a few every night, like four or something. And the little ones, the good thing is we could put nine of them at the same time in the same screen. So it was like, okay, boom. Um, but it, it did take a while. I, I spent a few weekends doing this, like, you know, from the early morning to late at night. We drank a lot of kawamas doing that, but uh, uh, it was fun and uh, very toxic. That's the other thing that I don't do this anymore because the inks that you have to use to print on metal are the worst possible mm -hmm. kind. It's probably, if I ever get like some weird brain thing when I'm older, uh, it's probably because of this. <laughs> yeah, I think they 
have changed a lot of those chemicals right. and many things. Well, the metal ones are like, because they have to actually adhere to the metal. There's some things that they have to be like that. So the only way around it is by wearing those masks and you can be perfectly safe. But we were like a bunch of like 25 year olds in Mexico City. We didn't really know. And if we knew, we probably wouldn't have cared. You know, it's like the 90s. I don't know. Uh, there was <laughs> ventilation, but we didn't wear masks, which is dumb. Like it's not, it's not, it's not very smart that I, we did that. Yeah. Um, you know. Uh, we, have a, we have a hand raised from Nelly. Hi. So I have a question. How maybe it's not directly related um, to the to the process of elaborating the art installation, but I'm just curious, how do artists usually participate in this art installations? Like I always wonder how's the behind the scenes of things? Ah, uh, well, that's a very good question, you know, and in that regard, uh uh the Cultural institutions in Mexico are very different from what they are here in the U.S. Um, this was part of a workshop that was taught at the uh, institution called the Centro Nacional para la Cultura y las Artes that in Mexico City has a whole, it's built next to Churubusco Studios, which was, you know, the equivalent of Studio City from the golden era of uh, Mexican cinema. There's still sound stages there, but now it has this complex dedicated to the fine arts. There's like uh, concert halls and movie theaters and museums, but there's also a very big school called La Esmeralda, which is the kind of like the, it's the continuation of basically San Carlos, which is the Oh no, San Carlos went to the UNAM, I think, or something like that. But it's like it has a relationship with the oldest education uh, institution for learning the fine arts in this continent from the Western perspective, right? Um, and uh, you can there's you can go there and get the MFA or things like that. But you can also uh, take workshops with artists that are prominent in. Mexican culture and some of these artists managed to get the funds from the government to put together exhibits in the spaces that are in this place after that and that's what happened in this case uh, we took the workshop uh, I was like about 15 to 20 people and the workshop was taught in this school and after that a uh, huge kind of like space there that is used as a gallery for installations was dedicated to put together a show where we showed all these pieces. So it was a uh, state funded, in this case, a uh, state funded endeavor that was aimed at the education for the arts. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's, that's a very... Uh, I, I like the support that you were given, and I'm sure that they're still given to many artists. So thanks for sharing, Luis. I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. No, that's one of the, the you know, the, some of the those great things. Of course, like, you know, I had to, I did have to pay for all my materials, but I was happy to do so. And uh, and uh, it's, it was a great opportunity. The, the rest of the show was great, but I didn't document it because it's selfish. So nice, so cool. Yeah. Well, um, we can continue talking about this one if you guys want, or I can move on. What do we do? Hay que seguirle. Le seguimos? Okay. Yeah. Pa acá. Ah, pa acá. All right. Goodbye, Ojo de Gato. Now, this one is called the Red Line Tour. This one is a uh, uh, big jump to about 11 years later uh this was a uh, work that i did in collaboration with somebody else called andy cavatorta after i went to get a master's degree at the mit media lab and this represents uh 
I wouldn't call it a shift, shift, but uh, like transformation and like my perspective towards not just photography but art in general that and uh, evolves from not just what you just saw in Ojo de Gato but other things and time that I have spent studying now digital media and interactive systems as potential mediums for 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 art making and this is a public art piece and you could see in the previous one there was already hints of interactivity where like I was able to put the installation together in a different way every time uh, that makes the art somewhat built towards itself being modifiable in this case by me but if you push that idea further you start to see uh, potential for the art to be created by the facilitation of these interactions and making it uh, a more of a sort of a less of a reflection of one's experience, but a reflection of the experience one has with others on specific communities that incorporate their own experiences as well as a part of a sort of um, action or happening that takes place in this case um, uh, in, in what could somewhat be conceived as the public space. So yeah, this one is from 2008. It's not, yeah, it is 11 years or 10 or nine or something. Ah, I made a mistake. I thought I was gonna talk about another one, but this is still relevant. Uh, this one is called the Red Line Tour. And what uh, I did for this one, uh, one compelled to put together a public art piece that interacted with the city of Boston and the public space in the city of Boston in a way that it would tell, that was kind of like the prompt, in a way that it would tell something about the city to the inhabitants of the city that I was living in. So I was also an inhabitant of the city using the spaces that were publicly available for them. And then, then again, I went in this kind of self-reflective manner in which I ended up conceiving, uh, I wanted to talk about and, uh, surveillance and segregation. And I wanted to somewhat use the subway transportation system in Boston as uh, not just my subject matter, but also my canvas and also the source, the subject of the message. Uh, looking at, as you traverse to one of the subway lines there, in this case, the red line, which is the one that I use every day uh, to go about from MIT to other places. Um, I realized how much, it, how much it changes if you take it all the way from one end to the other, how much it changes once you enter Harvard and then you go to the Boston Commons and then you start going out into the distance. And I realized that if I started looking at surveillance cameras within that system and observing them as if I was a bird watcher, like, you know, people have this hobby when they go to the park or something and they watch the birds and take pictures of them. So I was thinking, I'm gonna do the same thing with the surveillance cameras. And I did that over time, but also across the distance in the city and doing it inside the subway stations, looking at where the surveillance cameras were, taking pictures of them and thinking about what they meant. And I realized a bunch of different things, which is, the density of the surveillance cameras was very different on one station from the other to the point where there were stations 
uh, where there were no surveillance cameras at all. And there were stations where you had, the Harvard is crazy. You will see that about it in a second. Uh, but took all these pictures, again, creating some visual artifact that then I'm gonna use to tell a story, which in this case became a little bit of a advertisement campaign to message the people taking the subway to look around for the surveillance cameras and think about what they mean. And uh, this was, uh, here is, uh, here are some pictures of the, some of the locations to give you kind of like a sense of the vibe of the red line subway stations in uh, Cambridge and Boston in Massachusetts. And uh, this is more or less how I went about it. This is an example, which is Harvard and Harvard Square. And this is insane. Like, look at the cameras in Harvard Square. Why, why in the world do they look like that? I haven't seen surveillance cameras like that anywhere in this planet. They look like out of a Bioshock thing. You know, it's like, what are they trying to communicate? There's not only a ton of them. They are saying we're the most robust surveillance you can ever see, right? And then... Um, here's one of them again with the advertisement that I had put together mimicking exactly the format of where you put them. And this is where the transgression happens, which is part of what I love about public art, that this kind of public art, you go to the public place and you intervene it without permission and without asking if anybody wants you to do that, right? And I did this for like all the different stations in the red line. I'm going to show only this one because some, otherwise I would take forever going through this. And I think the point is made very simply just like that. There is a picture where like I'm installing them. Uh, we did that uh, very early at like 5.30 or 6 a.m. when the train starts running. And we did it over a bunch of trains. And then that was it. And something that I found like very interesting is that you know uh boston and cambridge that's a college town there's about 42 colleges in that city and a lot of them are specialized on medical science and uh you know training people to become nds and stuff like that there are a lot of labs for like pharma research and neuroscience research and all that. And when you go to the subway in this city and you're just sitting there going from one station to the other, you see a lot of advertisements for you to go and sign up as a test study for experiments of the mind and of the body so that they can pay you and you can go drink more beers or whatever you want to do with that money. But there are a lot of ads. You can look at them here on the the first two pictures in the bottom, one of them is probably for depression, the other one is for sleep. And it became very interesting to me how like the combination of the campaign for awareness against surveillance, distribution of surveillance in the subway train is now kind of getting combined with these ads for the real world that always hint at, you know, mental health issues and behavioral anomalies that you want to deal with by going to a laboratory where they can experiment on you for a couple of days or weeks or months or whatever it is. So that combination was very interesting to me. And yeah, that's it for this one, I think. Uh, how are we doing on time? Uh, we have about half an hour left. Not a lot of time. Do we want to keep going or talk about this one a little bit? We could just talk about all of them at the end. We have a half hour left, right? Yes, sí. Cavatorta, Andy Cavatorta. You can Google the guy. He's like a crazy person that makes uh, 
musical robots, but he was not a part of this one. I thought the other project that is about to come was going to come here. That was my mistake. This was a project that I did by myself. I'm glad that I saw that and I could uh, point that out. That was my bad. I kind of got confused. It happens. Um, mm. so it got dark. So this one was by myself. It was a public art piece that I did a part, as part of a class I took at MIT. And I did deploy it in Boston. And it was very uh, interesting. Yeah. Eric says, those depressing ads remind me of daily news. Yeah, <laughs> especially these days. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, yeah, that was, you can see how photography was just to tell stories. In this case, a story, uh, you know, about uh, about surveillance and about segregation. Like, why are there cameras some places are not others? And like, look look at them and ask questions about them. Um, so I'm going to move on unless feel free to interrupt. Uh, this is the one that I did with Andy Cavatorta. Uh, uh, shoot. I lost my cursor. There you go. There. And this is another piece of like, uh, yeah, that's the guy. This is another piece of public art that I did with him. And um, this one uh, uh, was uh, done in an uh, art gallery that a friend opened in the neighborhood of Red Hook in Brooklyn, New York, which is an interesting place in New York City because um, at least at the time, it was the only neighborhood in one of the boroughs that didn't have a subway station in it. So in order for you to get there, you have to do it by other means, like walk or take ride a bicycle and all that. But then one day, uh, then one day, they put a uh, IKEA in this neighborhood in the docks. It's a very historical fishing neighborhood. Uh, when they put the IKEA in there, they also IKEA itself started doing this thing, having a ferry that would go from Red Hook to Chinatown in Manhattan, back and forth all day long, bringing people back and forth from Chinatown to the IKEA for free as a way to lure in customers. Uh, in New Yorkers, the New Yorkers quickly started realizing that that was basically free public transportation to a location that was very cool, which was Red Hook, uh, a, a, a historical Brooklyn, neighbor, Brooklyn neighborhood that had a history of like fishing. It has also projects that are mostly, uh, that were mostly inhabited by they are still mostly inhabited by African-American and people of Caribbean ascent, like Puerto Ricans and Dominicans and Haitians and things like that. And because of the IKEA ferry and probably other reasons, the overall kind of gentrification of the Brooklyn borough at large, uh, it started to get the fishing dogs started to be populated by uh, like a pretty vibrant artistic community that uh, so the situation, the artists and the original inhabitants kind of like lived in this little bubble of Brooklyn because people couldn't get there by train, but there were a lot of traffic at the same time from the IKEA ferry. And this art gallery here, uh, that's Red Hook right there. That gives you a picture of where it is in, in, in Brooklyn. And... Uh, the place where this gallery was, which I visited my friend there one day, um, is, you know, on the left-hand side, the building on the circle. And this street called Richards that crosses there on the diagonal uh, separates the neighborhood in... Uh, what I found to be like a very interesting way, which was on the right hand side of Richards, you got you can see the beginning of the projects. If we go back here, uh, 
Well, no, you cannot see anything there, sorry. Uh, you can see the beginning of this project. So on the right-hand side of Richards, that's where the Caribbean, African-American, working class background population lives. And on the left-hand side of Richards, you get the fishermen and the artists. And I noticed that they were all living very cordially amongst each other, but there was almost zero interaction between one side and the other side of Richards. And came up with this idea about making a scale version of this intersection and then going around the street, talking to people and asking them if they could let us take pictures of them to make these little dolls from them and then put them then in this scale model of this intersection. And you can see on the right hand side, there's a 3D model uh, in the circle, that's that box represents the gallery. And you can see how this intersection is going to be put together in there um, alongside a few other artistic artifacts. Now, the scale version of the neighborhood, which was laser cut and assembled using a particle board, is way smaller in scale than the dolls. Uh, we did that in person, in purpose, so that the dolls are like pretty much Barbie sized. And you can see here the gallery assistant uh, standing in for a crew of filmmakers that uh, made a little short about it. And in the background, you see the installation in progress with all the people in there. Um, here you can see me kind of taking the back side of the subjects after taking the front side and that's how we would assemble the dolls they would be the back side and the front side they would be then put together and pasted onto particle board and then laser cut and then you have this kind of like you know now you would probably 3d scan them and 3d print them but back then this was what we could do and it has kind of like an artistic quality to it that i really like on the on the right hand side you can see the assistant whose name is Anna uh, posing with her doll and the hammer that she used when we got the doll. And in the background of the last of the pictures, we made a wallpaper with just the outline, the silhouettes of everyone that got captured. And the idea with this was to create some kind of hype around the events that was going to happen in the gallery that would get everyone from the neighborhood inside the art gallery to experience the art gallery together people the the people like the guys on the left hand side at the top would have never they would have walked in front of all the galleries that were there but they would have never walked in them uh, so we got this group of people that was living with the art world but not interacting with it to get in there and experience it in a way that they themselves became the art and that uh we thought was very powerful we the the film crew made a little documentary about it and it was like screened on the wall of the gallery and it was kind of like a whole uh very 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 nice thing and there's a ton of stories of like uh, stuff that happened there. Uh, I have uh, the little filming here, but maybe I'll share it so that you can watch it later if you're interested. It's only four minutes. Uh, uh, you know. Basically, we start by asking people to stand still while we take a front picture and the back picture. And then we print those in laser printer would you let us make it all of you? So, you know, the thing goes on and uh, you can watch it later or I can play it if we're out of time. But I think it's probably I, I was willing to play it. But since we don't have a lot of time, I think it's, uh, you know, somewhat nicer if I continue talking and then we chat a little bit and I can share URLs of where all this media is located for 
later if anyone is interested. Uh, so this one is called Black and White City. This one is from 2004, and it's closer in spirit to Ojo de Gato, but it's also something that in terms of, you know, you saw the other two, how like uh, the pictures, the photography was used to create stories that then when used to, then were used to intervene public space and communicate with the members of a specific community or social group, like the people that use the red line train in Boston, or in this case, the inhabitants of Red Hook to compel them to interact with each other in a way that they didn't do before. And, uh, and uh, it's not as a direct uh, transition from making a picture and then making a story out of it, like Ojo de Gato was. But this one, Black and White City, is uh, this one uh, was a residence, uh, artist in residence that I got again through like one of these Mexican institutions that support the arts to go and uh, uh, make a graphic arts installation that in this case reflected upon the experience of life in, in, in New York City. And again, lots of photography and lots of video and then lots of curation and trying to understand what to say about the city and in this case it's uh probably it was my first time in new york city actually so it was like fairly overwhelming and uh i i focused for that reason in uh sort of uh experience of the city in isolation. I, uh, during this time, even though I did a lot of fun things there and I met a ton of people, I also experienced a lot of the city alone late at night, just going on the trains or walking around, all those kinds of things. And I think that somewhat really influenced my framework. And I started thinking about, about kind of like, very similar stories to the protagonist of Scorsese's Taxi Driver, right? The like the the deep thinking loner that gets caught in these crazy loops of like imagination and paranoia and madness. And kind of I went there a little bit, uh, but not in a bad way, just in the storytelling way. And all those pictures started to be processes. I did came up with some characters that were basically living in isolation surrounded by this skeleton of a city. And here you can see me processing all these photographs, playing with how to make them work in sequence, and also starting to make the, the originals for a series of screen prints that I never ended up doing. I, I, start, I, I, I ended up moving away from screen printing into just drawing with uh, ink and uh, and uh, making animations in this case. Uh, and you can see here uh, some of this uh, effort of now very deliberately using digital tools to mess around with the pictures of the city. I did a series of them where you can see the top right and bottom left corner uh, where I would basically take these pictures in the middle of a busy day in Manhattan and take out the people and see how it looked like, like a city with ghosts in there where the people become these silhouettes. Um, you can see how this started to brew within me the idea of something that I could do in the opposite manner when I went and did the Red Hood thing, in, in, which, in which rather than being an observer that removes the people from the picture of the city, you are a participant that welcomes the people into becoming a part of a representation of the city. 
But because of the nature of this, uh, these are some of the ink drawings that I made there. And then again, starting to look at them and uh, thinking about how could they become the landscape of a uh, character that's walking through them and thinking about what's happening to them. Uh, this is the final installation I did there. Another thing that I loved about my time in Manhattan because it was very different from my experience coming from Mexico City. It's like you would go that walk down the streets and there would be a completely perfectly functioning television in the street. And I would like grab it and take it and make it part of my installation, you know, that kind of thing. You would never see that in Mexico. Nobody will throw away televisions, cameras, printers, computers that work. Uh, so this became that installation uh, in the studio that they had given me. And I wrote a few stories that, funny enough, I forgot about until very recently when I was thinking about putting together this uh, presentation for you all. And now I'm looking at them and I'm thinking about rewriting them because at some point, Last year, I started putting together a scene uh, using the pictures from this experience to make a little scene, which is, you know, not a graphics installation like the stuff I used to do, but something like this. It, I made a, I, I even made a, a dummy for it, but it's a picture book, right? And um now I'm thinking uh transforming it into not a picture book but a actually written book since I have those stories and I do write and and use the pictures as illustrations for it and make it into something else. So I'm working on that. Uh it's a long journey for this project, you know, that started in 2004 and then fall back from my memory uh probably about a year later and up until very recently. And it's a very interesting thing to, for me at least, to see how uh, these images inspired these stories that I wrote about living in New York City that then I forgot about that now have a meaning that can be very useful for me to understand my own memory. Um, and that's it for this one. Um, and finally, uh, I want to talk a little bit about something that uh, is the reason that I met Luis and Abraham. And uh, I'm very interested in these days. And I find it like not only a great source of inspiration, but also a place where I can very comfortably uh, deposit my artistic expression, which is uh, scenes, making scenes and going to scene fests and reading other scenes and interacting with the scene community at large. And this is a scene that I have been making that is called Defectuoso and is a street photography scene that I have been putting together with my archive of photography that I have collected from 1984 to date. Uh, so it's tons of cameras used and lots of pictures from like all different eras, but all very important from the perspective of experience. This is experiencing the city at the ground level on foot. Uh, and very important to this. Uh, some of them in the cars or public transportation, but mostly on foot. And a funny thing that happened with this one, uh, which has to do in a way with, uh, not in a way, very directly with the concept of ekphrasis, just to kind of like close things around that concept that is very important to your workshop right now is that uh, I originally intended to put together these scenes as pictures accompanied with writing about the pictures and as a kind of like autobiographical essay, memoir, fiction kind of thing. Uh, but uh, while putting together these scenes, 
I was having so much fun with the pictures and printing them on the risograph printer that I kind of, in part, got lazy and decided to just do that thing that I do all the time, which is use the montage techniques to, you know, juxtapose sequences of images in a way that they convey a sense of storytelling. And again, I also have a video here that I can share where it is. Defectuoso, in a nutshell, is a serialized photography journal about life in the streets of Mexico City from 1985 to 2019. It is my own personal witness account. The Spanish word defectuoso used to be the nickname for Mexico City during the time I lived there from 1969 to 2006. It is a wordplay derived from the abbreviation of the words Distrito Federal, Spanish for a federal district, the city's former official name. Today, Mexico City is officially known as CDMX. Defectuoso means defective in Spanish. In my opinion, a fairly appropriate label for any city that grows to be that large. He explains it a lot better than I do, so I recommend that you kind of Go check it out. I can put the URLs on the chat uh, as soon as I uh, exit this presentation. And, you know, we still have, what, a minute? Uh, About 10 minutes. Yeah, so let's, uh, you know, Q&A and all that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Stop share. And uh, I'm going to listen now for a moment and copy a couple of links. Yeah, the uh, defectuoso scene was definitely the one that, that uh, you know, introduced us to each other, right? Because we were um, sitting next to each other at the Print Pomona Art Book Fair. And uh, when I got up to to check out uh, my Tokayo's table, you know, it was definitely the first thing that caught my attention because of the, the, the colors. And, you know, I love photography, street photography specifically. So, yeah. Um, definitely check that out. Uh, but does anyone have any questions or comments about uh, Luis's work? Yes, Julie? Very inspirational. Um, I loved how you were so directed by your photography in a narrative way. But it always kind of like bounced back to the picture you know pictorial sort of narrative and it it really did something to my brain that i hadn't it hasn't happened before and i'm grateful for you to you did something that opened something up in my head that's thank gonna you. help that's me cool. move forward thank you very much thank you thank you it makes my day that you say that really you know, as an artist, uh, oftentimes all you expect is to touch someone in some way. So that's great. Yeah. That's great. Uh, yeah, I think uh, to me, it's, uh, I, I like to call myself a filmmaker from the future, but that might mean uh, filmmaker lost between dimensions or somebody that looks at the world uh, with the eyes of a filmmaker and wants to do so many things with that, uh, get lost in the process. Um, I think there's some of that uh, that happens to me. And then I, you know, dabble between cartoons and architecture and public art and all these kinds of things. Technology for the longest time was really something that attracted me so much and uh, now i'm kind of like wary of it obviously because of the times we're living in and thinking about it from a completely different perspective but it's still been very useful to me that i immerse myself so much within it so that i now can have a critical perspective about what the what are the relationships between technology and power, between technology and capital, between technology and uh, policy, and how can we interact 
with the different media that revolve around us so that they can potentially be set up in ways that uh, actually do what they are supposed to do, which is help enhance our human experience from like a human perspective rather than uh, help enhance systems of extraction of value for you know, investors and things like that. Um, so it's still useful for me, but to, to kind of frame things from a technological perspective, but I definitely try to look at it uh, differently now. I think just one more comment. I think um, your idea of subversion is really uh, an interesting uh, thread in your in in your ideas, and I'm I'm really interested in that in what you do. Um, so I I I see that in your future, but I I think that it. It's just a, a really, really interesting thread in what you do. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like I've been looking at how to say things for a long time. And I might be able to start just saying them now, you know, in a more clear manner. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think that that takes a lot of artists a while to get to. Yep. Abraham? I found fascinating because, like, I have met you, like, later in life, but to see you, how you incorporated technology when it was fresh. And now, for example, when you're looking at the cameras, now you look at the state of the world, that's even more... Uh, what's it called, scary, the way we've been tracked and the way we've been used and misused, especially with AI, like all these, how do we take up on these new technologies in the way that we used to do that? Or I don't know, maybe it's just our generation that we're more worried than younger generations nowadays, right? It's probably yeah. the pace of getting old. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, but I think we're going through a sort of a, transition phase right now that uh you know there was a digital technology boom that was very utopian and very hopeful <laughs> but also in a very fake way all that a lot of that was driven by you know investment interests and now we're coming to realize the reality of all those you know utopias what they what did they actually mean uh, how the things like social media that was supposed to help us communicate together and everybody has a means of expression and a publishing, a personal publishing channel, basically. I mean, when you think about this in abstract, sounds great. If you go back to 2003 and think about that, sounds like a dream come true. But then when you realize that that comes with the shackles of extractive capitalism and you put 20 years on top of that, you end up where we're at. Uh, so the thing is, uh, we know that now. We know that technology is nothing but what we make of it. And, and whether we continue letting this situations take place or not it's probably up to us a little bit so yeah yeah and well thank you for that and also uh i i really appreciate the fact that you use the people in the community to draw the people of the community to the gallery this is one of the things that we're always trying to tell our students like sometimes you have to forget oh this is my project it's like my art art and you know, have to remember that this is for people because as a people, you have to get them interested of what you're doing. And that's kind of the epiphany of it or like the, the, the perfect way of showing that, like let me interest the people by giving their interest, which the interest is a little selfish because it's them, but I like that they use that at its core and then it work that way. It's pretty good. I mean, that's the, you know, that's the power of contemporary public art. It's really, it's really an art form that uh, at its core, as, as I believe, or I think that as the way it's understood by the main proponents of it, it's, it's basically 
you as an artist, you are act as a conduit for the enabling of social programs in a way that empower people to just improve the way they relate to their world and public spaces are out there and they are becoming smaller and smaller because of the privatization of everything and it's another one of the uh big struggles that uh i think it's important to take a part on like how how can we go about the conservation of public space and you can look at the difference between the global north and the global south and how much more public space even though how much more lack of infrastructure there is on the global south. There's a lot more public space there than what you can find in the global north, where, uh, you know, the public spaces have started this from a long time going to be replaced, to be replaced by fake public spaces that are really privatized locations like shopping malls and things like that. So it's that's another thing. I mean, the fact that you have to go in a city like Boston, that you have to go uh, to the subway stations to find something that resembles a public space. And that's because the the subway train system in Boston is publicly owned and publicly operated still. But that might not last for long, right? Like there's that tendency of thinking that, you know, uh, public goods should not exist in this country and uh, they should uh, and then there's a difference between public goods and government control and it's very difficult to understand that difference uh, sometimes uh, in the global north uh, but yeah i mean that's just we can talk about all these things forever uh, yeah mm. happily to yeah. Happy do it any other time by the way um yeah thank you for <laughs> Abraham, are we talking communist now? Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, thank you for for uh, sharing your work. Um, Eric wrote in the chat, really inspirational body of work. I can see the progression and influences of various projects, especially integrating past works to the more recent stuff. Do you plan on taking your storytelling further, perhaps in something more immersive, VR stuff or augmented reality? I'm adding that part. Um, uh, not if I can, but uh, who knows? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I had a, I had a job working on a VR studio for ten years, and I quit because I was, you know, just eager to look elsewhere. Uh, so I'm, I'm now more in the real world than in the virtual one, and uh, you know, I intend to continue printing stuff and writing stuff and maybe making films and something that I would love to do again, but I haven't done in a while is more like public art programs. Perhaps there's a way to, you know, resuscitate the shrinking of the people thing with uh, communities that could appreciate this, where it could make sense for them here in LA somewhere, you know, I don't know, just thinking. Sounds like a future project for, for us to think about. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, you have your thing going on with the transportation systems, right? It's like, mm -hmm. that's, that's just kind of like honey. It sounds like honey to me. <laughs> so there's nice the, the thematic alignment. I like that. Yeah. So um, it is just past eight o'clock if in case anyone does need to log out um i did put the homework for this week in the chat if in case anyone um is curious uh the homework is in the spirit of luis blacayer's artwork that is curious about how we see things create a photo and poem that analyzes how we see and are seen i didn't have time to translate that since i just made it up nice get yeah. um but again <laughs> that's hard uh maybe um the point is to obviously have fun and interpret the idea of how we see and how we are seen uh as openly as you know you you are you can interpret it right um you know obviously black Ayer has his own style and his own his own way of of maybe answering that 
that theme, that prompt, but uh, I'm sure all of you can can do this. And, uh, you know, you only have to do one. So uh, unlike the last homework where Abraham asked you to do two poems and two photos, uh, you only have to do one, one photo and one poem, uh, whether they're related or not, or, you know, it, it, as long as you are thinking about that idea of how we see and are seen. Um, and of course, you know, we'll give you until, um, well, this time around, I want to see, I want to push you all to see if you can turn in something by Friday. So that way for next Tuesday, we'll have your work ready to workshop. Um, thank you, Abraham, for translating that. Um, so, yeah, and you know, if you have already pre-existing photos, feel free to use pre-existing photos. Don't feel like you have to go out and and take a new one. Um, but uh, yeah, I just want to say again, you know, thank you, Tokayo, for joining us tonight. I really appreciate it. Uh, for everyone that joined in on the live streams, also thank you for joining in. Um, don't forget to follow Luis Blacayer at cartoon underscore distortion on Instagram and most of the other social medias too, if I remember correctly. And you can check out his website, cartoondistortion.com to see more of his work. Um, and yeah, thank you. Uh, anyone have any final questions or comments for, for my tokayo before I close out our live streams? Thank you. No? Thank you. No, thank you. It's been an honor and a pleasure to... <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right. So with that, I think we'll um, go ahead and stop the recording and the live stream.